Um, hi, everybody. Welcome to the first uh, afternoon session. Uh, first speaker is Carlos Barbosa, who's going to talk about mind this relation. What can cognitive science learn from Nishitani's philosophy? Well, good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here. Well, I would like to start by, by contextualizing where I, the idea came from first. And this what I'm going to present today is part of a part of my dissertation, so it was not part of the nuclear argument, the topic, the central topic was another one, but I found it very interesting in its own way, it was one of the discoveries that somehow I, I had along the way. And uh, <clears throat> secondly, I would like to mention that I want to do this in the spirit of something, of a comment made by John Moraldo last year in Brussels, he mentioned that if we want to uh, prove, or we, if we want to make the case openly that Japanese philosophy has something to say, or has a bearing, or that it is relevant to study Japanese philosophy in our century, it is relevant, it is necessary to uh, show how this can tell something to uh, scholars of other areas of philosopher, uh, philosophy or even to scholars of other disciplines. So I think one of the most, in, well, to me, one of the most interesting lines of research in this respect is mind, precisely. The concept of mind, the philosophy of mind in general, but also what can Japanese philosophy tell the science of mind, not only philosophy. Uh, my topic today, anyway, is, is more narrow, it's, it's very specific. I want to explore uh, Nishitani's notion of mind in religion and nothingness. This is a, just as a starting point. There is more stuff in, Jap in, in Nishitani's philosophy to explore this, but I think that religion and nothingness is a good, is a good place to start because, um, as I will try to show here, the basic elements are already present. Uh, later on, I would like to, to, to briefly mention what I would consider to be materials to, to uh, investigate later in order to expand this uh, line of research. And also what it can, as in the spirit of, in the spirit of what I said, what it can tell um, cognitive science and the philosophy of mind. Uh, so, basically, the presentation has three parts. First, I would like to. The first part is negative. What is the kind of views of mind that Nishitani opposes explicitly in religion and nothingness? The second one is what is the alternative he, well, apparently has in mind. And finally, um, I will mention the trends, or well, the, the, the way I would consider this could develop in the future. Uh, so, first of all, concerning what are the views or the, the way of exploring or considering the mind that he opposes, I would label it reductionism in general. So what he opposes, well, in general, the, his attitude in religion and nothingness is in opposition to reductionism. That is the topic of my dissertation. It would take too long to, to explain how it is the case. Anyway, from that basis, uh, I would like to simplify the, the explanation by using two different passages of the book. So in the English translation on page 11 and 12, there's the first passage. He mentions uh, the bond of life. But he says that uh, modern science could have proven that the ancient view, well, it could have been, it could be the case that uh, modern science proved that um, traditional views of spirit were outdated. That is, probably it would be too hard to, to show in any way whatsoever that uh, the traditional beliefs in spirits and ghosts are a better explanation of agency and mind than neurophysiological theories or uh, cognitive science theories. Uh, however, he says that in the, at the bottom, this traditional view um, should not be completely left out. There was a question behind it, and he calls 
well, that's what he calls a soul well, and sympathy. There is something that we find in several creatures and other human beings, of course, and we realize that we connect to that something. We have no other name for that than soul. His example is there is a fly or a mosquito entering the room, and then I'm, I'm sick of the, of the mosquito, and then so I hit, hit it, and there's a sound of uh, distress. And I can't describe it by any other way but distress, a distressing sound made by the mosquito. It's, kind of, it's a kind of recognition that there is some way of... Uh, there is something that we find in the mosquito and not in stones or tables. And we have no other name for that something than soul. And we realize it because at bottom we feel certain connection between mosquitoes, between, uh, well, connection, a connection between ourselves and mosquitoes, or between myself and other human beings or other animals. And we have no other name for that than, well, his name for that is psychic sympathy. I, ha I think that we should understand the sympathy in terms of simply connection between mind and mind. Simply, I, I, I interpret this as saying that well, he accepts the idea that science has uh, overthrown traditional conceptions of mind, but the same problem persists. And what is this problem about? We recognize that there are some entities in nature that do not have a will, do not respond when, answer, when, when, when uh, asked questions, do not have feelings. In brief, they do not have a mental life. So what is the difference between, what makes the difference between those entities that we can connect mentally with and thus those entities that we can't. What is the difference between a chair and a bird that makes the, the chair simply an inert object, can't respond, which can't respond, and a bird which can respond in mental ways? Um, the second passage I would like to highlight uh, appears on page 13. There he says, in his way of uh, addressing the issue of the I, the cogito, the modern cogito. I quote, I do not have it in mind for the cogito to be explained through anything else at all from above it, teleological for, teleologically for example, or from below, reduction, uh, and ultimately reduced to that something else. Rather, I want to turn to the ground of the subjectivity of the cogito and there to consider its origin from point at which the orientation of the subject to its ground is more radical and thoroughgoing than it is with a cogito. I take this as... Um, my interpretation of this is in light of uh, Nishtani's uh, discourse in the book that he wants to reject a subjectivist account of mind. For example, an account, typical account that could be typical, probably, of uh, Husserlian phenomenology. Not that he rejects it outright, but he says that he wouldn't um, like an account of the mind that considers the mind isolated from the rest. Somehow a self-confined uh, understanding of mind. Uh, he doesn't want to reject the idea that uh, psychophysiological explanations can bear upon the explanation of mind. But he considers that that is not sufficient in itself. So no outer explanation, no inner explanation, what remains? No subjective explanation is, is, well in, is good enough. No objective explanation is good enough. What is the alternative? And I read this from his uh, view of reality, which is better exposed in chapters 3 and 4 of the book. Um, let us remember that he sees reality there in terms of interrelatedness. The term used usually in translation traditionally is circumcession, circumcession, uh, circumcessional interpenetration, which in Japanese is ego te kisonyu. All things exist only in relatedness and in relation. I think that if we go further enough, what we realize is also uh, an implication of this is also that there is no part in me. If I am an entity in reality, there is nothing in me that is not in relation to something else. And this in two important senses. In the usual sense, in the literal sense, every part of me is in relation to something else, to other parts of me or to other 
entities and reality. And in the second sense, everything is in relatedness. That is, the place where being is possible is relatedness and not the other way around. If we apply this conception to mind, so the result is that mind is in interrelatedness. Mind can only exist in interrelatedness. Here we start seeing the suggestion, how, how pardon, how, here we could start to see how from Nishitani's philosophy we could respond to the question of what is mind and because here we've, uh, we've only mentioned what mind is not or even more specifically how it should not be explained. The issue is, the issue is if it should not be explained reductively, it should not be explained teleologically, how should it be explained? The answer lies in this, interrelation. But the type of interrelatedness that is specific to the nature of mind has a lot to do with uh, an idea that he develops in chapter 5. The crucial term here is... um, co-projection of mind and thing. The way he introduces this idea is through the notion of obtaining the mind of. There is an expression in Japanese, kokoroe. Kokoreru means obtaining, literally obtaining the mind of. And well, in, according to his explanation, this is the way it, that in Jap- well, this is a way in Japanese of saying understanding the meaning of something. But this doesn't mean or I don't take it as meaning that uh, things have a mind. The, the way we should interpret, it, uh, interpret this here is in relation precisely to co-projection. To quote Nishitani again on page uh, 184, I think, 178. He says, To obtain the mind of the meaning of a given matter, a given koto in Japanese, to apprehend its ratio or logos, is for the reality that has become manifest as that koto to transfer essentially, just as it is and in its suchness, into the man who understands it, and for the man who understands it to be transferred into that reality. So, mind is not, understood in this key, mind is not something in me simply. Because meaning is not simply in me, meaning is not inside me simply speaking but it's not out there either meaning only emerges in the lively relation of co-projection between mind and thing the knower and the known and this is something that intellectual knowing can only get in abstraction it is something like taking a, a picture of a process in movement if you for example go to an amusement park and you take pictures of your experience in the amusement park that explain you, explains something of the meaning, what it is being in an amusement park, but it never replaces, it never conveys completely the experience of being in an amusement park. Just to, to, to make an example. Um, so again, the, I, I take this idea of co-projection not as meaning that uh, things have a mind. It's not a kind of panpsychism. And the main reason I consider it so is because in some other places, in some other essays, Nishitani explicitly says that religion first, but we could could extend that to tradition, needs to go through the purgative fires, as he calls it, of uh, mechanical science, which in a certain way means it's fine, we can accept the idea that the whole of reality can be explained to a certain point mechanically, and that suggests that panpsychism would not be an appropriate answer to the problem of mind. But he doesn't buy mechanism, mechanicism yet. He doesn't buy mechanicism either. There is something else, of course, that needs to be explained. What is that something else? It doesn't rely on the, on the, on the, on the fact that there is mind somewhere else. No. Simply, we have a mind. Things like a chair, a chair or a table don't have a mind. But reality is so that Mind is not simply something in me. Mind doesn't rely, I mean, the place of mind is not my brain, not even my body itself, considered in isolation from things known. 
but actually the place of mind is the lively interrelatedness between this body and another body, this body and a certain factor, to be more general. So, the, I think that in order to understand how this is possible, we need a concept that somehow suggested when he quotes Basho, he says, but Basho said once, from the pine tree, learn of the pine tree, and from the bamboo, off the bamboo. This is from, he, he quotes uh, Basho in page 128 of Religion and Nothingness. So, Nishtani uses this passage in, a, um, in such a way that he introduces the notion of attunement. The, notion, the idea here is that in order to know things, in order to really get what things are in reality, there is no way that we can use a certain formula, for example, a certain abstract theory, and then we just apply to things. That cannot be replaced by the operation of actually attuning to the particular individual thing. And this is why he, he rejects reductionism, but reduction, because reductionism just tells you, you have a, if you, we can uh, reach to the point of getting a full picture of reality in concepts, and then we just apply this picture to all things. Nishtani would say this is not possible because particularity cannot be left out of the picture. Nothing replaces the real concrete contact with things. And in order to know the thing, we need to attune with the mode of being of the thing. And this attunement is possible because from the very bottom, we are in the disposition. Our mind is a way of, of uh, projecting ourselves to the outside. Um, but it is a way of projecting to the outside that goes in two directions. We project ourselves to the outside, but also in a way of projecting ourselves, things of the outside project onto us. That is the place that makes attunement possible. And if we want to recover contact with reality, that is, if we want to know reality, we need to return to that point of contact, to that somehow elemental or kongenteki, originary point of contact. So, in general, well, I can't give the details of this because of, of well, there is, don't have much time. But what I would like to suggest is that this is really close to several um, alternative trends in um, cognitive science and the philosophy of mind, particularly in activism. In activism already recognizes the idea that mind is not simply within a brain, that mind consists in a double relation between the body and things outside. Uh, but I found out an interesting case, uh, call, a book called The Cradle of Thought, Exploring the Origins of Thinking, written by um, Peter Hobson in 2004. It's, different, it's interesting for two reasons. One is that he's not a philosopher. He's an expert in neurophysiology and uh, the development, in, well, an expert in, in, in autism. Um, and second, because in his account, relatedness is central. He claims that in order for human cognition to develop, I mean, it is necessary, I'm not, sorry, to put it better, the place where, or the origin of uh, human cognition in child development is the relations, and the emotional relations of the child with other human beings from the very first days of, of their life. So it is tempting to say that we could project the, this, this piece of research in two ways. First of all, it would be interesting to consider other clues in Nishitani's philosophy to expand and clarify several points that probably could, uh, that I, I couldn't, uh, I could give today only in, in brief. Uh, for example, theory of imagination could be interesting, uh, well, uh, Nishitani's account of imagination in his later work would be interesting to explore the details and to work on the details of uh, the way or the form of the double um, co-projection. And there are also some comments he made that I don't know much about, about mind in his later lectures at Otani University. Um, secondly, another way of expanding this or developing this, this line of research would be to see how it relates to, the account, to accounts of mind as the ones I explained a few minutes ago. Um, and I think that's all. If, there's, if there are any questions, well, I'd be glad to answer. Thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, if there are any questions or comments, please call us.
we have about 10 minutes. So. I would like to ask a, a question. Um, since you have <coughs> written your PhD thesis on this subject, you are the, you are the expert. Um, so I just wanted to ask if you know whether in Nishitani there is some yardstick or measure for judging our understanding true or false. Mm -hmm. Because you said uh, mind is always interrelatedness, or mind is always in interrelatedness. Mm -hmm. And you also said that when I understand something, I have to transfer the thing I wish to understand into myself, and at the same time, I have to transfer myself into the thing I wish to understand. If I cut this correctly, if not, please, uh, please correct me. And I wonder whether there is some room for f for right understanding and wrong understanding, because we all know we can uh, fail in our attempt to understand s something. And I think uh, it would be interesting to know whether Nishitani has some clue to answer this question. How can we measure whether our understanding is true or false? Well, I think that's a very, very interesting question. I think it's definitely relevant. Of course, we need a theory of error. It's part of explaining the mind. There, is a, there's a, there are two levels of explanation here, as you probably could identify. One is explaining what the mind is actually as a fact. But there's another level. How should we know? What are the conditions for knowledge? And in philosophy of mind, I think it's easy to recognize that these two questions are quite close to one another. So uh, I think you're right. The, uh, this, is, this needs to be addressed. So the question is, uh, well, does Nishitani have an account of what, how to tell error from truth? And I, well, so as far as I have seen, he doesn't explicitly have such an account. But I think that there is a clue for this, so we need to develop it. Um, but the clue for this, I think, is precisely the notion of attunement with things. So I would say that what we, the hypothesis that we could formulate here is that to the extent the, that attunement with things is close we tend to be more true. To the extent that that attunement uh, breaks, we tend to be in error. But it is interesting to see that this um, allows for degrees of uh, true and falsity. It's another interesting consequence. I just was asking because the attractive thing of reductionism re is you have an explanation of the mind and at the same time you have the yardstick of the right of, of, of wrong, right? So in the count, for instance, if my representations fit what I am representing, then it's right. If not, I'm wrong. But with another theory, you have to provide the other level of explanation as well. And that's the real uh, compelling task for the future. But you do yeah. Indeed. Well, reductionism is attractive for several reasons. That's one powerful. Uh, that's a powerful one. They already have a theory of error, or so they claim. So, well, we need to provide a theory of error here. We want to complete the, the account, of course. Thank you. Well, I guess thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, also, kind of, I'm interested in this Nishan's con connection with the mind. And um, I was. My question is quite a kind of, kind of a mundane one because I know that the, uh, his philosophy has been uh, kind of briefly and very superficially been uh, <coughs> treated by uh, Francis Varela uh, in the 1990s, mm -hmm. and then I think Evan Thompson did has done a little some towards a similar direction since then. But has there has there been any other research in the West on this issue? Um, as long as I know, there hasn't been any more efforts. Well, Barella, well, it's easy to imagine probably Barella could have read more about Nishitani or could have read Nishitani's work more closely. 
but life is the way it is, and he passed away too soon. And he was, I think he was also only reliable on whatever translations were. I, I, I guess. But well, I think, I think we can complete that, 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 well, in our own way, we need to, I think that's a line of, of, of research that has much to say today. It is still, I mean, reduc reductionism in the sense that, 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 I, that I implicitly refer to today is the idea, well, in the case of the study of mind, this model, the paradigm, the reigning paradigm is still the computational model of mind. And it's still the standard, and I think there are very good reasons to oppose it. There are not oppose it, but there are good reasons to revise it, deeply revise it. It's not that we have to deny that they, it has something to say. I think that there is no way to deny that more and more ways of explaining the mechanisms of the mind are being discovered. I could also say that more ways of more ways of explaining uh, mechanical, uh, f uh, sorry, mental facts mechanically will be discovered in the near future. The point is. What we need to insist on is that that's not the only thing that matters. That if we forget relatedness, we can't get the full picture. I think precisely that Peter Hobson's book is a proof of this. He says, well, in the, in the study of autism, experts have got it wrong all the time because they try to find everywhere, they find in the brain, they, they try to find out in the brain, they try to find out in uh, child rearing, they try to find out everywhere, but the relation of the child to to their milieu and to other human beings. And once we do that, we connect the dots much better. And it also has some cultural implications, I would, I would even say, to the extent that people are more and more understanding themselves as computers, they are being disconnected from what they really are in their concrete life of relatedness to other things. Okay, we still have about uh, three minutes. Uh, very interesting question. Uh, what uh, would uh, Mishitani, or what do you think Mishitani would think <laughs> about the thesis of supervenience? And for that matter, what would you think? Mm. Weekly uh, said uh, thesis that there's no mental change without a brain change. Because after all, uh, suppose we say the mind is the brain, mm. even Kahneman's brains in a vat, in Spelanker experiment, are related. They cannot exist without the vat. Mm -hmm. Our brains are in a vat, that is, in our heads. Mm -hmm. And they cannot exist if they are not related. So what is really missing in reductionism, if reductionism, as Nishitani's theory, allows for a relationship which is essential to the existence of the mind. So the question is, what is missing in a non-reductionist picture of the mind? Or yeah, and, and what Nishitani would say. What would Nishitani okay. would think Well, I have two things to say, because usually it happens, I have understood that the way I speak about Nishitani sounds like I'm a partisan, like I want to defend him. <laughs> and <laughs> just to clarify, it's important to say that I don't think that Nishitani could have tell, told us a lot about what we need to know about the mind today. But I think that he has a very powerful toolbox. So it's not, in a certain way, I, well, I'm not a partisan, but I also see that there is much to exploit there that we couldn't have, couldn't have found out other, uh, otherwise. Well, that's the idea. But secondly, about what is missing in a non-reductionist picture of mind is precisely that, uh, well, reductionism Reductionism's main idea is that analysis only is enough in order to understand things. So if I analyze the parts and then I see how they fit together, that's all I need to know. In our case, for example, in order to understand the mind. So in that, if that is possible, then a perfect theory, ideally speaking, a perfect theory of uh, neurophysiology and anatomy would be enough in order to explain the mind. In other in, in a few words, the mind would be reduced to the body, or the mind would be reduced to neurophysiology. Uh, what happens is that, precisely what is missing here, is that the body, well, we can fairly say that this, that neurophysiological mechanisms are necessary in order for there to be a mind, yes, but this in isolation does not 
is not enough in order to understand how this connects to the world. The problem is that reductionism starts from this and then needs to answer the question, well, how this uh, mass of cells then can know things outside and relate to things outside. It, from a Japanese viewpoint in general, from a Japanese viewpoint, we could say it otherwise. We, we, we have to invert the question. First, we assume from the beginning that the body, this mass of cells that we call a, a mental entity, a, a man entity with a mind, from the very beginning it was shaped by its relatedness to outside things. Then the question should be, out of this, how does the mind arise? If we start that way, we cannot allow for reductionism because we are assuming from the very beginning that the mental entity and its environment are co-creating themselves at the same time to say it like uh, Barela would have said it. That's it. Okay, uh, we're running out of... You okay? Okay, you can ask questions after, after this. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Carlos. Um, thank you.